All right, greetings and welcome to the first uh, DCS2, uh, which uh, we love acronyms here at the University of Cincinnati, so that stands for Data and Computational Science Series version 2.0. We do at least have to with that. Uh, so the first DCS2 lecture and luncheon in this academic year. Uh, my name is Brad Warren. I'm the Associate Dean of Library Services here for the University of Cincinnati Libraries. And filling in for uh, Dean Wayne, who is overseas in China right now, unfortunately couldn't be with us today. Um, I wanted to tell you a little bit about uh, DCS2 before introducing our speaker um, to get you interested in the various types of programming and uh, workshops that they put on throughout the year. But they really are trying to bring innovative workshops of distinguished speakers of advanced research data topics to the University of Cincinnati research and education community. Uh, some topics include high performance computing, cloud computing, data visualization and analytics, uh, research story mapping, spatial analysis, artificial intelligence and, uh, intelligence and machine learning. Uh, with the recent opening of our new uh, vis uh, visualization laboratory space in the Geology, Mathematics, Physics Library in Bronstein Hall, this year's particular area of focus uh, is on data visualization. Uh, with the Research Data Services Group hosting uh, beginning to advanced level workshops taught by internal and external experts um, that will enhance visual thinking and data visualization best practices. Um, so before we get started, I also want to uh, especially thank Don Jason, uh, who I think is actually outside right now. Uh, he has really done an outstanding job organizing and putting uh, today's event together. Um, and I'll just say, John, uh, Don, thank you so much. <laughs> and we're going to give you a round of applause so you can hear from here. Um, and so I really want to thank all of you for attending for what I certain will be a informative, engaging talk by our esteemed speaker, Doc, uh, Dr. Lisa Federer. Uh, so Dr. Federer is the Data Science and Open Science Librarian at the National Library of Medicine, focusing on developing efforts to support workforce development and enhance capacity in the biomedical research and library communities for data science and open science. Uh, prior to joining NLM, uh, Lisa spent five years as a research data informationist at the National Institutes of Health Library, where she developed and ran the library's data services program. She holds a PhD in Information Studies from the University of Maryland and an MLIS, Master's in Library and Information Science from the University of California, Los Angeles, as well as graduate certificates in Data Science and Data Visualization. Her research focuses on quantifying and characterizing biomedical data reuse and development of meaningful scholarly metrics for shared data. Her lecture today is entitled, If You Share It, Will They Come? Quantifying and Characterizing Reuse of Biomedical Research Data. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Federer. Thank you very much. Thank you all so much for coming. I'm really delighted to be here. Let me see if I can figure out how this works. Oh, there we go. Easy enough. Uh, so thank you for coming. Um, delighted to be here for my first time in Cincinnati. And I'm going to be talking to you today about uh, some of my research that looks at what exactly is happening with biomedical research data that has been shared. So a little overview of what we'll be discussing today. Uh, first, some background on how did we get to this point where we have all of this data. And I'll be talking a little bit about some of the policy uh, and practice at the National Institutes of Health the National Library of Medicine. That's not the main focus of my talk, but kind of keep that in the back of your head if you do have any questions. I'm very highly involved with the implementation of the NIH Strategic Plan for Data Science and have been working in this space um, at the NIH for the last six years. So um, if you have those questions, definitely let me know. Um, and then I'll get into the actual research itself. So looking at uh, the methods that I use to track data reuse and explaining a little bit about what happens with these data sets once they're shared. Uh, and then finally sharing what the implications are for looking at all of this. So a little background to get started. We are at a point in time where we have more data than ever before. Partly that's because we are able to generate data much more cheaply and much more quickly than ever before in the past. What you see here on the screen is a, a chart of how much it costs to uh, sequence an individual human genome over time. When we first did that with the Human Genome Project, that took about 13 years and uh, several billion dollars. Now we're at the point that we can do it 
in about 24 hours and it costs about $1,000. So we just are able to create and store data at a rate that we never were in the past. So we are, are generating quite a lot. There's also not only more data, but the data is more openly available to people. So we have uh, quite a lot of subject-specific repositories where people can put their data so that others can get to it. We have uh, more general repositories where you can put really almost any kind of data, uh, as well as institutional repositories. So if you are at a particular institution, you can put your data there. So data is no longer locked into an individual's lab or, or a person's computer, it's out there for other people to use it. Part of that is driven by people just you know, out of their own goodwill wanting to share their data, but a large portion of this data sharing is driven by policies that come from funders as well as from journals. So uh, now a number of the major journals that you might publish in do require that if you're going to publish in their journal, you do have to make your data publicly available, as well as funders now requiring this. Uh, the NIH is currently in the process of finalizing our uh, data sharing policy that will apply to all NIH funding across the board, uh, that the draft provisions went out for public comment last year around this time, and the actual draft policy will be going out for public comment likely in mid to late October of this year, so be on the lookout for that. Um, and there already are a number of other uh, sort of more specific policies like a genomic data sharing policy, uh, policies that apply to sharing for certain levels of funding. Um, but this, I think, it will be a pretty major change in that it will apply across the board. So just a little bit of background on uh, the NIH and our space in uh, the biomedical research community. So uh, we are the primary biomedical and public health research institution in the U.S. and we are the National Institutes, plural, because we are comprised of 27 institutes and centers that are focused on specific disease areas, organ systems, or types of research. And we are making a very major investment of nearly 37.3 billion uh, annually in medical research. Uh, we are hoping that number will go up this year when we get our new budget from Congress. Uh, we do have an extramural research program that is the bulk of our funding, awarding uh, quite a significant number of grant funding to institutions like all of you, uh, as well as an intramural research program, which is the world's largest biomedical research institution uh, in our main campus at Bethesda, Maryland, as well as a few other satellite sites um, in Montana, North Carolina, and uh, Baltimore and a few other places. So we are doing a pretty significant amount of research ourselves as well as funding research that's going on around not only the country but around the world. The National Library of Medicine is one of the 27 institutes and centers, and we uh, do actually do a significant amount of research ourselves at the NLM, particularly in the areas of information science, informatics, uh, quite a lot of work in doing things like natural language processing to automate some of our research and work with the biomedical literature. And we are all also the world's largest biomedical library. And we have things that you would think of a library of having. Uh, we have quite a lot of books. We have, um, I heard the figure of 65 miles of underground tunnels. I don't know where all those tunnels are, but they're filled with books. Um, but we also are a very significant resource for data. We are sending out over 115 terabytes of data a day to over 5 million users worldwide in the form of not only the biomedical literature that you might access via our tool PubMed, um, but also other sorts of genomic and bioinformatics type of data. We're also receiving data from around the world, adding to those collections. Uh, over 15 terabytes of data a day from 3,000 users around the world. We are also very dedicated to facilitating open science and scholarship. As a library, open science is very much part of our uh, you know, sort of way of thinking and our mission by making digital research objects fair, findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable, as well as attributable and sustainable. So um, these are important missions for us to make sure that the data that uh, you know, people around the world are creating are available for others to use. So the motivating question for me is 
what's happening with all this data? We have all of these policies that require people to do this. We are putting a lot of funding into creating these repositories for, uh, for data. But there's been very little research into looking at what is the actual impact of that? What happens to these data once they're made publicly available? There's a fairly significant body of research that has looked at researchers' attitudes about data reuse. Do they actually want to reuse data? As well as factors that influence researchers' decisions to use a particular data set or not, um, and the subjective experience of researchers in a few disciplines, particularly like um, earthquake research, geology. Uh, but there's not really been any sort of look at what happens with all of this data. And so that is what I hoped to uh, start to figure out. So why does this matter? For one thing, science functions largely as a credit economy. The way that people get credit in research that they can turn into you know, grant funding or tenure and promotion is through credit in the form largely of uh, journal citations. So I put out an article, other people cite it, I'm able to use the number of citations as a means to show my impact in the research space. Bibliometrics is a means to quantify this impact. So there are um, there is a large field of study looking at how do we track uh, citations to articles and how do we really understand what those citations mean in a way that we can meaningfully give people credit. But we don't really have this yet for data. So it's really difficult right now for uh, anyone to get credit in a meaningful way for the data that they share. This is important because uh, not everybody is on board and excited about data sharing. Uh, there is a somewhat famous or infamous uh, editorial in the New England Journal of Medicine that referred to people who reuse data as uh, research parasites. So this idea that um, I put my data out there and somebody else reuses it, they're sort of, you know, parasite, parasitizing my data and getting credit for something that they didn't necessarily do. If we have means to reward the people who share their data, then we're not really having parasites. We're having, uh, you know, this credit economy that we can apply not only to journal articles but to data sets as well. So a little background on how I went about doing this. As I mentioned, it's really difficult right now to track data reuse. There's uh, not a lot of standardization in the way that a person might cite a data set that they've reused in an article. So it's really tricky to know how many times a data set has been reused, where it has been reused. So the approach that I took as a proxy for reuse is use requests. So a number of repositories just make their data available and anybody can download it um, and potentially reuse it. It's really difficult to know, though, what do views or downloads of a data set mean. Just because I look at a data set or even download it doesn't really necessarily mean that I'm doing anything with it. Uh, these use requests, though, are a meaningful way to, as I say, you know, as a proxy for reuse. So here I'm looking at requests for three different repositories that have pretty sensitive human data, so you can't just put it up for anybody to download. A person who wants to use these data sets has to submit a detailed request explaining what they plan to do with the data set. In most cases, they actually have to have uh, IRB approval from their own institution. So not only do we know pretty specifically what the person intends to do with the data set, um, you're not really going to likely go to all of this trouble if you don't actually intend to reuse the data set. So although this is not a perfect measure of reuse, it's a fairly useful proxy for reuse uh, for the purposes of this study. So as I mentioned, there are three repositories that I looked at here, all of which are uh, run by the NIH. The first is dbGaP, the D Database of Genotypes and Phenotypes, uh, which is out of the National Center for Biotechnology Information within NLM. This is genomic data. And then the other two are clinical uh, data repositories. One is for the National Institute of Diabetes and Digestive and Kidney Diseases, the other for the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute, so people that get funding uh, for clinical research from those two institutes put their data here for others to reuse. And again, all three of these, because of the fact that they do have this pretty sensitive human data, do require uh, people to submit a use request. <laughs> 
So we're looking at a pretty large number of data sets and requests here. You'll see that dbGaP has a very significantly higher number of uh, data sets and requests than the other two. So the data that we have for this is a little bit better and you'll see that some of the findings that come out of that just because there is so much more um, are a little bit more meaningful than the other two. Um, but this is looking at over a course of many years all of the requests that are coming in for data sets. You'll notice that the total number of data sets requested is a lot larger than the total um, number of requests in many cases because a request often includes um, a single request uh, asking for multiple data sets. So what is happening with all of these data sets? The first thing that I wanted to figure out is what are people doing with the data? So I looked at these use requests, read them, and categorized them by the type of reuse that the person was proposing. In many cases, a person is proposing an entirely new original research question. They're going to take this data set and ask a new question on this data set alone. As I mentioned, many of these requests are for more than one data set. Um, so often these requests are for a meta-analysis study, taking multiple data sets, combining them to ask a single question of this larger pool of data. There's also people doing things that are a little bit different than you might expect, um, things like method studies. So I've developed a new statistical method or a new software tool, and I want to test it on some real-world data. So you can request this data for that purpose. Um, other times, people are looking for validation of something like, we tested this in a mouse model. We think it will also apply to humans. Let's get some actual data and figure it out. Um, other times, comparison or control. So I have a disease group. I want to compare it to um, normal, healthy human control control group. Um, in a few cases, people are looking at reproducibility. So in other words, I take the original data set. Can I reproduce the findings that the original group came up with? Um, that is a whole other discussion. Reproducibility is a pretty significant problem in the biomedical research space. Um, and then finally, there were a few data sets that were um, essentially the requests were for infrastructure. So I have a bioinformatics core at my institution. I want to pull in some popular data sets that then my, my researchers can use. So these uh, categories are based on um, existing literature as well as as I was looking at the requests inductively adding new categories where needed. So what we find, um, I have these done for dbGaP and NIDDK. I was unable to do this analysis on the NHLBI uh, request because they didn't provide me the actual text of those requests. But what I think is interesting here is that we see a pretty significant difference in the ways that people are reusing genomic data versus clinical data. So um, a majority, about 70%, of the genomic data requests were for meta-analysis. They were going to take multiple data sets from dbGaP and combine them in one study. On the other hand, clinical data sets more often used in the context of original research. This makes a lot of sense if you think about the types of data that we're seeing in these two uh, different sort of genres of data. Uh, genomic data, for one thing, you kind of need a lot of data because uh, to do something like a genome-wide association study, to get adequate statistical power, you need quite a lot of data points. Uh, genomic data is also, by design, a lot more interoperable than clinical data. So from the start of uh, genomic research and, and human and other non-human uh, sequencing, it was a major goal to make sure that whatever I gathered in my lab and whatever somebody else across the world gathered in their lab would be interoperable. So that was a very conscious effort to make sure that that was the case. Not so much with clinical research. Uh, a lot of these studies, even though they were looking at very similar topics, not always collecting data or asking questions in the same way. For example, in the um, NADDK repository, one of the things that they look at a lot is um, you know, very al various alcohol-related uh, illnesses. So looking at the data dictionaries for these data sets, you'd see that they're asking things that are pretty similar, but not in a way that you could actually combine the data sets. So one study might ask, how many 12 ounce uh, alcoholic beverages do you have per week? And then another study might ask, how many glasses of wine do you have per week? Or how many beers do you have per week? Close, but not exactly the same, and something that we wouldn't necessarily be able to combine those data sets. So there are efforts uh, that are going on to make those uh, types of clinical data sets a little bit more interoperable, things like common data elements, uh, which is an effort that we are 
are uh, leading at the NLM to say, okay, here is how we're going to collect this data so that going forward we're going to be able to combine things a little bit more meaningfully. So another thing I was interested in looking at is, you know, if we think about one of the concerns that people have is this research parasite idea that somebody's going to come along and scoop me. I share my data and they're going to like steal my idea and get to it before me. I was curious to know, is it really true that people are taking a data set and like looking at the exact same topic? Because I suspected people are not necessarily. So the way that I uh, did this was to look at um, the description of the reuse and use the NLM Medical Text Indexer, which is a um, tool that takes the text and will look at what is in the text and apply MeSH terms or medical subject heading terms to that text, which is very convenient because the data sets already have those mesh terms applied. So basically I could go in and say, okay, here is uh, the reuse text. What is this about? And it will give me a list of mesh terms. This is super cool because uh, it doesn't have to use the exact term that shows up in the mesh vocabulary. So like the medical text indexer knows that tumors uh, is neoplasms in mesh terms. So it's a really nice way of getting the subject for a large bulk of, uh, you know, large set of text without having to actually do it yourself manually. So, in order to compare the similarity of a use request to the data set topic itself, I used this concept called semantic similarity. Because of the fact that mesh terms are arranged in a hierarchy on this tree, you're able to get a numerical uh, quantitative measure of how similar one term is to another. So for example, if I have a data set that is about heart diseases and the use request also gets coded with heart diseases that's identical, the semantic similarity score is one. On the other hand, if I'm looking at a totally different type of reuse, something that's on a completely different branch of the mesh tree, uh, like informatics, for example, that gets a score of zero. They're nothing alike. Um, and then we have scores in between. So, you know, things like different cardiovascular diseases are going to get a higher score in relation to heart diseases than something like eye diseases, but they're both diseases, so they get a higher score. So all of this can be calculated for every single term pair uh, in the mesh hierarchy. So I did that for, again, the NIDDK and dbGaP requests since I had the full text of those. And what we see here I think is really notable for a few reasons. Um, one is that there are quite a lot of use requests that do have a score of zero. In other words, they're looking at a completely different topic of uh, you know, study than what the original data set was created for. Um, and we also see that you know there are quite a lot, especially in the clinical data, that have a score of one. They're looking at something that that is uh, the exact same topic. But particularly with the genomic data, we kind of see a, a broad spread of more or less similar types of reuse. So um, one, I think that you can make the argument that people are doing a lot of different things with data than the original purpose for which they were collected. And so maybe that concern about getting scooped is not necessarily as much as it might be because people don't want to do the exact same thing um, with the data as what you, know, you created it for. And again, we see a higher similarity with those clinical data sets, probably for the same reasons that I discussed earlier, that um, the clinical data are a little bit trickier to use in other contexts or to uh, combine with others, whereas genomic data lends itself a bit more to that. So the next thing I was interested in is who and where um, is this data being reused. I was hoping that we might see that um, people who are reusing the data sets are maybe junior researchers or early career researchers who don't themselves have uh, access to some of the maybe expensive equipment to collect these data sets, as well as you know where in the world are these investigators? Are people who are in less funded areas potentially benefiting from uh, you know data sets that have already been collected? Collected. So I was able to code uh, the reuse requests with the uh, career stage of the investigator at the time that they made the request by uh, manually looking up people's CVs and LinkedIn profiles to see where they were when they made that request, um, as well as geocoding so I could do some geographic analysis. So. A tricky thing with figuring out where in the world people are reusing data is that research is not equally concentrated around the world. A country like the United States has many, many research institutions. A smaller country like Liechtenstein, for example, 
obviously not as many. So it would be unfair to compare these two evenly. Um, so rather than simply count the raw number of requests, what I did was uh, calculate the difference in composition uh, to figure out basically compared to your research presence, how much data are you requesting? So for example, um, the US had 67% of the requests in I think the um, dbGaP data set, but it only makes up 11.6% of all of um, the universities in the world. So what we get is that um, the US is pretty overrepresented in terms of the number of its requests. It's 484% uh, overrepresented compared to its research presence. So looking at this across all three of the repositories, you can see obviously that the US is pretty signif significantly um, overrepresented in all three, um, and that those countries that appear in blue very very underrepresented. So um, obviously the reuse is very largely uh, you know, centered in the US. But looking at this, um, some of the other overrepresented countries, what is interesting here, there's different overrepresentation across uh, the three repositories. Some countries are using a particular repository more than others. But where we look at countries that are overrepresented for all three, they are all English speaking nations. So Australia, United Kingdom, and United States. This kind of makes sense. Uh, the data sets are, you know, the documentation is in English. You have to submit a use request in English. Um, and it's probably just regionally, people are more aware of these things in the US because they are based out of the NIH. Um, but I think this is a, a somewhat interesting finding. Looking at that career status of requesters, um, what we see here is that there is um, quite a lot of the requests are coming from more established researchers that are a little bit further on in their career. Uh, what is another interesting thing here, I think, is that there's a statistically significant difference in the requests between the genomic data and the clinical data in terms of um, sort of phys physician researchers or clinicians requesting the data. This, again, I think makes a lot of sense based on the type of data that we're looking at. Uh, clinicians it makes sense would be looking at clinical data versus genomic data. Um, but again, I do think it's interesting that these more established researchers are requesting more of the data sets compared to the earlier career researchers. One limitation here is we don't necessarily know if the person who requested the data set is actually the person who's going to reuse it. Um, so this you know, more established person might be requesting a data set on behalf of their student who's actually the one to reuse it, um, but they're not able to put that request in themselves. So um, a little bit limited here in terms of what we can take from this, um, except that we do see that there are more requests coming from those more established researchers. So another thing I was really interested in looking at is tracking data set requests over time. Um, a, a challenging issue is to figure out with so much data uh, coming in, where do we focus our attention in terms of curation? Do we curate everything? It's not um, a cheap or quick thing to do in terms of this uh, you know, heavy curation of the data. So are there ways that we might be able to tell certain data sets that we should prioritize for curation over others? And so my, my question question was, um, if we look at early data set requests early on in the data set's life, do we see a pattern that continues over time of higher requests? So um, I looked at, uh, for one thing, just looking at the sort of track of uh, requests and also did uh, some regression looking at how predictive early requests for data sets were uh, to overall requests of the data sets. What I found here was, particularly with dbGaP, uh, how much a data set is requested in the first year of its life after release, very highly predictive of how much it will go on to be requested over time. The chart here that you see on the left shows uh, data set requests by their overall percentile. And you can see that uh, the top percentile in purple uh, is already way more highly requested than the other uh, sort of lower percentiles of data sets in its first First year, and that only continues to increase over time. The same thing is true when we look at the uh, three models, the one that uses just first year requests and then adding second and third year requests. Uh, we can get a pretty good sense of the data sets that are going to go on to be highly requested just based on how many requests they, re they get in the first year of their life. Um, this is a little bit less uh, obvious in the NHLBI uh, data set, and I think this is because, again, I mentioned that we have a lot more uh, just in terms of count of requests from 
uh, DB gap versus NHLBI. So I think part of what we're seeing here is just a lot of noise in the data. Uh, but with the regression models, it does, again, hold true that early requests are generally predictive of long-term requests. So next, I was interested in looking at, uh, again, how could we predict what data sets are going to go on to be highly reused? Are there certain topics of data sets that people are requesting more than others? So the way that I did this was to um, use uh, topic modeling to uh, get clusters of similar data sets in the uh, repositories. So for example, I would feed in the descriptions of the data sets, and the model would put out uh, a number of different clusters of things that are similar and it would show me the top terms associated with them so then I could look at those terms and figure out what that cluster is about. Uh, so for example, in this cluster, the most highly predictive term was gastric emptying, um, then we have abdominal pain, um, and so these are things that as looking at this I can figure out this is a set of uh, data sets that are about gastroparesis, a GI condition, and some other GI conditions so I could go in and label what uh, those data sets are about in those clusters. So here again, we don't have an equal number of data sets across all of the clusters, so you can't compare one to one. Um, so what I did instead was calculate the request to data set ratio. So for example, topic A has four data sets and 70 requests. Topic B has only two data sets and um, a lot more requests, 122. So here we would see that topic A is relatively under-requested uh, compared to its composition within the repository as a whole. Uh, so this allows me to see what topics are over-requested based on the representation in the repository and which ones are under-requested. And I know this is kind of small, but what we see here is uh, the request to data set ratio in uh, dbGaP. And there are uh, some interesting findings here in that there are some very highly over-requested uh, types of studies and some very underrepresented. So the dotted line that you see in each graph would be uh, basically if every data set was requested or every data topic was requested at exactly the rate that it was represented in the repository. Um, and we see that that is not the case. Things that are the more common conditions, there we go, uh, like blood and cardiovascular diseases, heart disease is the you know, most uh, number one killer in the US. So it kind of makes sense that people are doing a lot more research in this area, whereas things that are a little less common, uh, like uh, congenital disorders, some of these rare inherited diseases, not as significant a disease burden, and so those are relatively under-requested. The same thing holds true um, breaking down uh, just cancer studies within dbGaP. Uh, the other or multiple cancers pretty highly overrepresented compared to some of the others. And this also holds true in the other repositories as well. So in the NHLBI data set, again, we see um, that uh, cardiovascular diseases pretty overrepresented as well as lung uh, diseases. Uh, some other things a little less represented, as well as in NIDDK. Um, so these uh, like type 2 diabetes, a very common disorder, compared to something like islet transplantation, a very specific uh, type of procedure to treat diabetes, pretty underrepresented. So again, we can see that across all of these, the more common the disease, the more likely it is to be requested. Oh, there we go. So got a lot of data here, what does this all mean? What can we take from this? So first, I think for researchers, there's some encouraging news here, which is that um, based on what I have seen here, getting scooped may not be as significant a threat as people expect. Uh, so since people are doing some pretty different things with data than what the original researcher was doing, it's probably not as likely as people might think uh, that someone's going to get in there and, and get your idea before you can publish it. Uh, sometimes researchers also say that they're concerned about sharing their data because somebody might come along and uh, try to replicate their study and refute their results. That was not a major case um, or a type of reuse in this particular data set. There was one single uh, use request that said, we think this study was wrong and so we're going to try and redo it. Um, but replication was a very minor type of reuse. So again, I think some of the concerns that researchers express about data sharing may not actually be borne out in what we see with data reuse.
There's also some, I think, important implications here for repositories, uh, the people who are actually taking in these data sets and having to make preservation and curation decisions. We simply can't keep everything, and it's probably not desirable to keep everything. Uh, as with a library, at some point we do have to get rid of some of the older books and things that aren't being used as much. Uh, and I think that there's some good evidence for making these decisions in the case of data sets. As I've shown, early requests for data sets are a pretty good predictor for long-term reuse. And there are likely certain topics that we would expect to be more requested than others. A caution here, though, I would say that um, you know we did see that the more common diseases are more highly requested, the rare diseases less so. That doesn't mean that we should just ignore the data from the rare diseases. In fact, if anything, I think those are even more important to curate and maintain just because they'd be harder to collect again, right? So a rare disease, there are fewer people that have it, um, whereas if we needed to recreate a heart disease study, we would easily be able to recruit people with that disease. So just because certain topics may be more highly requested doesn't mean we should necessarily ignore the others. And then for funders and institutions, um, I think we're at a really interesting point in time where we have some decisions to make about how we want to reward uh, people who share their data sets. Data sets are reused in a lot of different ways of, as we've seen here. So should creators be rewarded equally for all of them? If I have a data set that is used in a meta-analysis with you know, 500 other data sets, is that equal to if I have a data set that is reused for an original study all on its own? Um, is, is one more or more significant than another? I don't know. Those are things we have to think about. And again, I think we are at an interesting point where we can be very uh, conscious of the choices that we're making in terms of how we reward people to avoid some of the pitfalls that have arisen in uh, bibliometrics in using things like article citations as a, a score of impact or a measure of impact. So when you have a measure, oftentimes people will figure out how to game that for their own benefit. So uh, you know, sometimes metrics encourage some sort of bad behavior, uh, things like self-citation or otherwise artificially increasing your uh, citation counts. We don't want to see that happen um, here as well. So what do we need to think about in order to create meaningful metrics that really reward people when their data sets are highly reused um, and not encourage some of those sort of perverse incentives? So I did mention a couple of the limitations here. It's unclear how closely requests do track to actual reuse of data sets. We don't know for sure if, you know, even though the person who made the request had a very specific use in mind, um, did they actually do that? Uh, maybe they got the data set and it turns out that's not, you know, going to be what they thought it would be, it's not going to work out. Um, we also don't know if the person who actually made the request is the person who's doing the reuse. Um, and there's also very limited generalizability to these findings beyond biomedical repositories. As you've seen here, the reuse patterns of clinical data versus genomic data are quite different. Um, and I would spec expect that to be even more different if we're looking at things beyond the biomedical space. So this type of study really would need to be done individually in you know, various different disciplinary uh, spaces in order to have meaningful findings for that particular discipline. So I want to acknowledge uh, my colleagues in the Office of Strategic Initiatives um, at the NLM. This is our data science and open science team. And I will be happy to take questions. Yes. So um, as someone who's been part of a group who has positive positive trait and DEF, is there a way for us to know how many times our data have been requested? And, and that, you know, usually the person who actually does the depositing, you know, is a data management type of mm -hmm. person. So maybe that information is going to that person. And as I'm sitting here, I'm thinking, gee, it would be nice if we could include in our grant proposals that our data have been used so many times. Yeah, so I don't know that dbGaP actually does any like reporting out of anything, um, but if you go to, so every data set in dbGaP has a web page um, that if you have the dbGaP accession number, you can get to. And you can actually, right on that page, get a downloadable um, CSV, comma separated value file, that has every single person that has requested the data set, um, as well as that full text of their request. So all of the, the data that I used in the study came right from their website. So if you have your own data up there, you can get all of that information 
not just counts of you know how many requests, but also specifically what people are doing with it. Yep. Okay. And I just want to comment. I, I do think that many times um, the application for data reuse mm -hmm. comes from the senior investigator, even though um, someone much more junior is actually using the data. Yeah. And maybe that should be that information should be requested on the application. Yeah. So part of what's a little bit tricky. Um, Definitely with dbGaP, but I think it's also true with the other two, you have to be categorized as a PI, a principal investigator, to be able to request this. So even if you know you are going to be using this, you may not be able to request it yourself. Um, so yes, this, these, uh, these data are not necessarily collected in the way that makes the most sense for us to analyze them for reuse. So you know this, again, that has a very significant limitation. What I would like to see going forward is better ability to track data reuse in the actual literature. Um, so I, I did another study that looked at um, looking at the number of requests a data set has received versus the number of citations I can find to that data set in the literature. And the number of requests is something like 75% higher than the number of actual instances of reuse in the literature. I'm 100% sure that not all of those requests are just not being reported. Um, and from looking at what I could find, people are reporting things in very different ways. So some people cited the art or uh, the data set in the acknowledgments, some people put it like in their methods section. So it's just very tricky right now for us to be able to easily track that reuse. Um, and so until we have better ways of doing that, we are sort of having to guess at who is reusing the data and for what. Yeah. Do you have like DOIs or something for each data set? So that I mean that should be cited if so they're just not doing it. So not all data sets have DOIs, unfortunately. Um, all three of the repositories that I looked at here do not yet have DOIs for their data sets. Um, I am hoping that is a direction that um, the NIH will move because that is sort of the future of being able to track data reuse. Um, we have good infrastructure for tracking DOIs because we have done that for articles for a long time. Um, there is a project right now called Make Data Count um, out of the University of California that is uh, trying, trying to do this. So the DOIs are one piece, actually getting a DOI for a data set, obviously you can't cite a DOI if there's not one. Um, and then the other piece to that is getting journals to tag um, those citations the correct way. So not only having a DOI that we can track, but having it tagged in the uh, sort of metadata of the article that this is a data set, not an article. Yes? So I'm sure that the funders are interested in the return of investment of yeah. sometimes a sizable amount of resources required to create a highly curated and usable, reusable data set. If you looked at that at all, so for example, I was thinking that you could look at the quantity and quality of the data in DB gap mm -hmm. submissions relative to what the reuse is. Yeah, that's a really interesting question. And one of the things that I really wanted to do was get like, what was the actual initial outlay of funds to get these data sets that are in dbGaP? And that information is surprisingly hard to find. Um, but yeah, I think that is a really interesting question and very relevant to funders. Um, I know that there are certain um, institutes within the NIH that do have um, RFAs, requests for applications, for grants that are specifically for reusing already collected data. Um, so I know that you know this is something that the NIH is interested in increasing the reuse of these data sets. And I think, yeah, the question of what is the economic impact of sharing is a really, really valuable one that um, I hope we can start to answer. Yeah. I think my question may be a little bit related, but I wonder if you looked at how much funding a researcher has had um, instead of looking at their rank as to who's requesting, I'm just thinking about the ebb and flow of the funding cycle and if somebody's trying to reuse data, it would be a cheaper way to do research. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that would be a really interesting question. I think, so it was kind of tricky to do because basically I have a list of requests that go back to something like 2008, I think. so it's hard to like pinpoint at that point in time. So I was able to figure out the person's career status based on like, okay, on their LinkedIn, it says that they were, you know, an assistant professor in 2008, and then they were promoted to associate professor in, you know, 2011 or whatever. Um, tracking that over time, I think would be a little bit trickier, but that would be a super interesting question. 
So you mentioned early on that part of the reason for sort of the dissimilarity between um, the amount of data looked at or, or reused clinically versus genomic mm -hmm. data um, is because clinical data is less inoperable than what we know genomic data to be. So what do you think would be the consequence of programs like the Precision Medicine Initiative and the Olivus program to make clinical data more interoperable? Uh, for reuse and then like even transitions across hospital systems and, and how do you think this data may change as a result of that? Yeah, I mean, I hope that we will see a shift in that over time. I mentioned the common data elements um, that I think will hopefully help make data a little bit more interoperable if people um, adopt those widely. And I know some of the institutes at NIH are actually encouraging people in um, you know their grant proposals to specifically use the most relevant CDE for their field. And yeah, I, I think that there are definitely um, efforts, as you say, precision medicine, all of us, um, that will be collecting data in a way that uh, yeah, is, is fully intended to be interoperable. So, you know, a lot of this, as I said, this is data that goes back to, you know, in some, I forget how far back the NHLBI and NIDDK data go. NHLBI goes back all the way to 2000. Interestingly enough, um, looking at the NHLBI data, um, back in between 2000 and 2008, you had to go to their website and mail them in the mail <laughs> a request for data, and then they would mail you in the mail a CD that had the data on it. Um, so the use patterns of, of those data sets changed quite a lot after they had like a real formal website where you could request stuff online in 2009. So yeah, what we see here, um, looking at some of this older legacy data, uh, it would be interesting to break it down over time and see if some of that um, you know meta analysis increases in subsequent years as data becomes more interoperable and again I think like continuing to track this over time will be really interesting um, you know not just you know what, what's going to happen in the future to see if some of the things that we're hopefully adopting uh, you know do make some real change yeah mm -hmm. Well, so I will say that there's not a lot of scholarly incentive for people to do reproducibility studies because um, you're not really going to get to publish those all that much. But there is increased interest in understanding whether things are reproducible and if not, why they are not. Um, so it's very interesting to see some activities that are really like specifically geared towards understanding this. So um, at the NIH, my colleague Marion Zering Halam um, ran two reproducibility workshops that were sort of like mini hackathons where it was three days and we got teams of NIH researchers, so very smart people, um, and got papers that were published in the bioinformatics literature and said that their data were publicly available in one of NLM's repositories. And a lot of them said that their code was available as well. So theoretically, these you know papers should have been easy to reproduce. And when we first started this, I was like, I don't know if we're going to need three days for this. Like people might just come in and like in the first half a day, like that's it, you know, just download the code. There you go. Uh, that was not the case. Um, when we we've done this twice and had I think something like twelve teams total, not one single team was able to reproduce fully any of the papers. Um, the data in many cases were not where they said they were, um, or the data were not what they said they were. So, um, you know, they say that the data is like the process data, but it's actually the raw data, or it's, you know, something else entirely. Um, the code often doesn't work. Things aren't documented in ways that are reproducible. Um, so, although reproducibility was not a major uh, type of reuse in this study, I think that there are some major questions about how we can do better at that, because I think we're not doing very well right now. <laughs> yeah. You talked about categorizing manually the different requests mm -hmm. by type. Yeah. Was that a one-to-one, -one, or did you have things that didn't fit nicely, and maybe you had to say, this one is a new statistical method, but it's also an original research study? Yeah, um, just to make it easier to analyze, I did choose the most you know major type of reuse. So for example, there might be things where I'm doing a statistical study and I'm getting 100 data sets. So is this a meta-analysis or is it statistical? But largely it was statistical, so um, yeah. So interesting about your thoughts. So um, a lot of big pharma companies right now are working on creating data lakes mm -hmm. and uh, they're incentivized. 
medical center, research world, um, there just doesn't seem like there is that incentive. Mm -hmm. And we're trying to incentive to keep the track of data. But really, is there, what, what else is there to kind of push? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so the incentive piece is, I think, a major missing piece of the puzzle here. So um, I think that institutions need to start thinking about how to reward this. Uh, and there are some institutions that are actually already making that move. Um, so the Montreal Neuroscience or Neurological, I always get them mixed up. Montreal Neurological Institute um, is has gone completely open. So everything that they publish is open, all their data is open. And because of that, they've really rethought their tenure and promotion structures so that you do get credit for sharing your data. That is an actual um, you know, first class research output that you get credit for. So I think that is a major piece of that. The funders will, of course, be part of that. Um, it is already true that you can list a data set as something on your bio sketch um, that you can get credit for and, and point to as a, you know, way that you can demonstrate your impact to science. So I think it's a big cultural change um, and the incentives piece is huge. So um, again, I think when we think about how to do that, we need to be careful about what metrics we select to do that. Um, and so I think this, is, this kind of work is um, hopefully informative to that and then the other piece is just thinking about how do we shift that incentive structure. Other questions? Well, I think we're about at the end of our time anyway, so thank you all so much for coming. Um, it's been great to chat with all of you.